series webinar and uh, we are going to be talking about what to do in the vineyard pre-harvest today. Um, so as usual, this webinar series is co-hosted between University of Minnesota Extension and University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. Uh, so this is a group of us who work with grapes and other fruit crops uh, to provide timely information via webinars. We started doing these last year uh, during 2020 and we decided to continue them this year uh, due to positive response from participants. And so um, we always try to provide info that people can use um, you know, directly in the weeks to come, depending on the stage of the grapes. And so this week, um, Matt Clark from University of Minnesota Grape Breeding and Enology Program is joining us, uh, along with Leslie Holland from University of Wisconsin. Christelle Goudot is not joining us today. She is in France, but um, as you know, she's our insect specialist, but the rest of us uh, can also help answer questions about insects and diagnosing problems if you have specific ones. So happy to touch on insects still today. Um, Leslie will be talking about um, harvest time diseases and Matt's going to start us off today, uh, giving us a little insight about what the grape breeding program at University of Minnesota, uh, which as you know, breeds a lot of the cold climate hybrids we grow in this area, um, what they are up to during the harvest season. It might be interesting to hear. Um, and so if you have questions during the presentation, we love getting questions. It helps spur conversation. Use the chat bar or the Q&A function for that. We can use either one. Um, you can also make comments in those too. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Matt can start. You know, you're still muted, right? Yes. Matt? Okay. Yeah, I was talking to myself. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Annie, for inviting me. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. If you have questions as I go along, certainly put them in the box and hopefully I can answer them. Um, my thought today was to run through a couple of things that we are evaluating in the breeding program, and in particular, talk about the DNA testing and evaluation that we're doing. Because when Annie invited me, I just got a bunch of data back. So I was really excited about that. And I thought, how, how could I or should I share some of that information and process with you all so you have a better understanding of what we do? So we're going to start a bit with that. So before I came in um, and started my position in 2015, our breeding program looked something like this. And I'll just walk you through it because you're going to see another image that looks about uh, similar to this. So we make a crossing decision in what we call year zero. That's when we choose all of our parents for the year to try to combine and produce a bunch of seedlings from. And the size of this circle represents the size of kind of a cohort of all those seeds we produce and how they move through the program. So we make the cross in year zero. We grow out those plants in the greenhouse the following spring. And then in that next summer, they move outside to a nursery where we start screening them for pests and diseases. And then from there, they get dug out, they go out in, um, into a cooler for a year, and then we plant them in a, or excuse me, in a vineyard where we start to evaluate them for fruit quality, which can happen years three, four, five, six, ten, 10, depending on how precocious they are to come into bearing. And as we go through this process, we start to make selection decisions at different time points. A big one is when we have plants in our pest nursery, we start to get rid of individuals that have powdery mildew, downy mildew, phylloxera. Um, so if they're pretty sick plants or sickly plants, heavily infested, they don't go any further in our program. Um, and then the next big step is what we're doing starting in the next week or two is the fruit evaluation. So once the plants start to fruit, that's when we come back and start focusing at this cohort. And like I said, this can take several years before the cohort's ready to go. Um, and then myself and different parts of our team, we go through and taste the grapes, which is really fun. Um, and it's pretty easy to, to pick out the losers. Those are really high in acids or they have some funky off flavors or uh, or we start to evaluate the plants for health still, diseases, insect pressure, um, growth habit, and so forth. But our schemes sort of look like this really for um, the last 40 years or so. But with the advent of DNA technologies, we've transitioned uh, our program a bit. So over time, we start with um, several thousand seeds in the greenhouse. And by the end of our second test, we have a handful of plants that move on to advanced testing. Well, um, 
now that we have better DNA technologies and the pricing has come down for sequencing, some of you maybe have sequenced your own genome and like doing ancestry.com or 23andMe, we're doing something similar with grapes. And so in the last six years, we've transitioned from a, a strictly traditional breeding program to one that uses modern uh, research techniques, including genetics, genomics, metabolomics, phenomics, gene discovery, and in the future, gene editing to give us a better understanding of the genes that we're identifying. And I'm telling you all of this because as a plant breeder, we would like to speed up the process or at least enhance our chances of finding new varieties. And it's better if we can do that when the plants are this size, like in the picture here, when they're seedlings with here just their, their seed leaves and a, a new leaf coming out. If we can make decisions about that plant's success and predict its performance, like having good wine quality and cold hardiness and disease resistance, we want to do that early in that scheme um, because it's costly to move a plant all the way through the end and a DNA test might shorten that time frame. So if we look at uh, the lower screen is uh, lower half of the screen is kind of where we're at today we've made some improvements to this scheme so by using DNA testing we can um, have certain impacts. For example, we can run DNA tests on our parents, which helps us make better predictions about the offspring. So we're sequencing and um, learning quite a bit about the parents, not just how they perform in the vineyard, but are the, the traits that we're interested, are they heritable, and is there a DNA test that we can run? So we can make some decisions before we make crosses with DNA information. And then we can make the cross, grow out the seeds and then collect a little bit of leaf tissue to get DNA, like the last photo I just showed you when the plants are small and have an impact well before the plants even move out into our nursery for year one. So if we do this right and our timing is right, we can get our DNA information back before we do any field planting, which can have considerable cost savings and space savings. And then the rest of the, the timeline sort of looks the same. But the difference is um, the way that we've approached this is to just make more seeds so we can make better crosses because we have more information and then we produce more. So in the last three or four years, instead of making a few thousand seeds, we produce about 10,000. Knowing that we are going to be able to put some of these seeds and seedlings into the pipeline for running DNA tests. So if you look, the size of the circles going into the pest nursery, maybe about the same, and then moving through the rest of the program are a little bit bigger. And that's what we've been doing. We've been able to advance seedlings that we predict to have better qualities, in particular disease resistance, going through that pipeline. I think the crucial thing is when we look at what we call the second test over here on the far right, that dot's a little bit bigger. We're optimistic that we're going to be starting to find more improved plants going into our advanced testing because our pipeline has shifted. Um, we haven't been able to necessarily prove that in our concept yet because our first plants that have gone through this process are just starting to flower and fruit this year. So you might be asking, how do we develop these DNA tests? Well, it takes a lot of research and usually a number of years to link the trait that we're interested in to markers. And fortunately, over the last half decade or so, um, the marker technologies have really improved, which means that we have more markers available to us and they provide quality and consistent information. And what we do is create um, populations. I'm going to describe one in a second. And th that allows us to test a whole bunch of plants, usually they're siblings of one another, and then determine if there's any association between a marker and then the trait of interest using statistical techniques. So the image on the left uh, is just kind of showing what a, the grape genome looks like. It has 19 chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes, and each black line, horizontal line represents a marker. And then within each column is a different um, chromosome itself. So those markers are sort of proxies for where the genes reside. And we typically think that one gene results with one trait and, and many of the traits that we're interested in. So the last couple of years, we crossed two parents, uh, Minnesota 1264 with Minnesota 1246, and did a couple of experiments trying to associate phylloxera resistance to markers. And we've been very, very successful. Oops, wrong direction. 
So I just put a pink box on. I'm not sure if you saw that float in, but on chromosome 14, through a couple of different experiments, we found that there are markers highly associated with resistance. And those markers become our new markers for um, running in future populations and testing more parents. And we're just doing that for the first time with our data, literally 10 days ago. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to be sharing this information with you. So if we zoom in to that chromosome, instead of just seeing lines, we also see what we call the genetic position. That's the number over here on the left. And then these S numbers on the right, that's the name of the marker. I don't expect you to remember anything about it, but we do track every single marker and its position in the grape genome. And then we try to put them to use. So we're gonna do a quick biology uh, review. In our case, DNA tests, we don't want to sequence the whole genome necessarily to learn about one little itty bitty gene. We want to use these markers as proxies. And we'd learned that one marker for every trait isn't quite enough. Um, we don't have high enough resolution. So in our case, we've decided to use about four markers in this example to try to associate the resistance um, from the one parent and trace it through the breeding program. So basically, we want to predict when can we find um, at each marker, the four over here on the left, when can we find this red A? And so we, we cross parent one, which is resistant to parent two, and we get a bunch of seedlings. Well, which of these markers is going to be informative? They, they aren't always informative. Fortunately, because markers are cheap, we can run hundreds at a time. And in fact, we're running about a thousand at a time. And we can find those that work and are predictive. So in this case, three out of the four markers, I tried to highlight those in these red boxes, are allowing us to identify the red A. We also have black A's, they look like red A's in this example, and unfortunately our markers can't tell the difference between those. So um, suffice it to say, with cheap marker technologies, we're able to screen individual plants and get thousands of markers, and fortunately we can this is examples for phylloxera, but we can use the same technique across the whole grape genome to look at things like powdery mildew resistance, muscat flavors, and so forth. So this has been one of the biggest um, advances that we've had in the last three or four years is to moving to what we call ramp seek markers. And I'm not gonna go into any more details, but our goal here is to say, where can we find this A? It's kind of like, where's Waldo? Where do we find this, these A alleles? And then um, how do we, um, continue to select for those in our seedlings so we don't have to advance um, susceptible plants. The breeding targets that we're focusing on are probably all things that you're wishing for in your wine grapes. So we were looking for low acid and we've really focused on less than 10 grams per liter with a target of, of less than six grams per liter of total acidity. We know folks are looking for more tannins in the reds and we have some issues with hybrid grapes and just start trying to sort that out. Um, certainly aiming for more vinifera-like grapes. We're interested in the short season because that's what Minnesota has and plants that maybe are early ripening, but probably more important that have late bud break, but still can ripen a crop in that short season because we know that frost in the spring is a major issue for grape production in this region and then disease resistance. Some of these things we can evaluate in the field um, and we, we start doing that as soon as the plants start growing all the way through harvest. And we're also looking right now in the field at growth habits. So really thinking about moderate figure right now, primarily because some of our key varieties like Itasca and Marquette and even though Fronsenax are very vigorous and some even have lateral shoots that become even more problematic. Fortunately, we do have markers for some of these things. We have markers for malic acid that are coming online. We have markers for aromas like methoxypyrazine. So those are green peppers, uh, green beans, corn. You, if you can think of a green vegetable flavor, that's probably one of these compounds. So we're selecting against that, but in favor of muscat. Those are the highly aromatic flavors. Um, and then powdery mildew is where our focus has been the last few years. We're trying to identify uh, grape seedlings that can have one or more of these resistance genes so that growers can reduce the amount of spray. And then phylloxera, as I've already mentioned, and seedlessness for our table grape breeding efforts. In the field right now, we are looking at um, varation and varation timing. 
This year is unique. It's probably the earliest operation we've seen in a decade. And by July 19th, I was actually out in the field and we had some of our seedlings in our program that were at 100% foration. The one on the right isn't quite there. Um, and that color change and softening is a lot easier to detect in red and black grapes. And um, one, because we can do it with our eyes and, and birds and other creatures are pretty good at that too. Other things for variation that we can look for, just touching the berries and even some of the aromatic grapes, we can start, start to smell those um, in the vineyard. In the next couple of weeks, we'll start measuring sugar content. And that's our good way for us to start tracking when these grapes are mature and when they should be picked for evaluation. Often in the breeding program, this is a single vine. This is one of our table grape crosses. It only has a couple of clusters on it. Its evaluation is probably just me and maybe a, the, um, the postdoc on our project, Aaron, tasting a couple of grapes and making a yes, no decision. Is it seedless? Does it have seeds? Um, is the plant hardy enough to survive another year? Does it taste good? And that's the decision that we make before we move to the next plant. Because we have about 10,000 other seedlings that we want to evaluate. Disease resistance is key. Unfortunately, 2021, we're not getting a whole lot of information in our research trials. We have a very low incidence of pretty much all diseases. Um, that's great if you're a producer, not so great if you're a plant breeder. But fortunately, the last couple of years, we've had um, uh, ability to take a lot of notes on things like powdery, downy, black rot, anthracnose, and then other things that pop up in, in our vineyards. Um, Crown gall, for example, Phomopsis sometimes. So this year we get to take a break from that, but we have to endure the heat and we'll be tasting a lot of fruit this year instead of making notes about disease. Our research is also focused on insect resistance. I could go on uh, ad nauseum about phylloxera, but we're also spending time on Japanese beetle resistance. And we have uh, a grad student named Dominique who's been looking at variety preference for Japanese beetles and cold hardy varieties. And a postdoc, Kate Freund, who's been doing some uh, QTL map, genetic mapping, I should say, to determine if there's some um, resistance and some genes involved that we can develop markers for. So back to what I was talking about a few moments ago. And the data so far suggests that there is some genetic resistance. So we're looking, to looking forward to her data from this year. Grapes are really, really, really visually appealing. I think that's why they're so compelling to many of us. Um, and I have the fortunate job of getting to see many of these grapes fruit and flower for the first time and assess the variation that we have in our breeding program. And I found two key examples that are almost exact opposites. The one on the left has this branched rachis with very loose clusters, medium-sized berries. That, um, that rachis or the the cluster itself is probably about 11 inches long. And that's one of the longest ones that we have in our cold hardy material. And this is a seedling that's just producing for the first time. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then the one on the right is something that if you're a commercial producer, you probably never want to see a cluster that looks like this, um, unless it had some really extraordinary value because it's a very small cluster, maybe has about 25 berries on it. And it would take a lot of those um, to harvest, to produce a, a crop, and to produce wine from. So not very economical, not what we're going for, but you can sort of see the variation that I get to see in the vineyard. And right now is an exciting time to be out there because we get to see and start tasting these things. We're also breeding for seedless grapes. So right now, because we're at Verasian, that's a good time for us to bite into the, the, our table grapes. They don't taste good, they're high in acid, but it gives us a first pass of what the seed trace or the seed size looks like. And the images here, just to give you a representation of what that looks like from very small, like Centennial and traditional seedless grape to Swenson Red, which has a gigantic seed um, fully functional seed inside. And so our breeding program is clearly targeting the smaller ones and for table grapes. And right now is a good time to, to do that. Um, you can put the grape in your mouth, bite into it and see if there's a seed or not. And um, we can make some decisions on that. Juice chemistry is important. I think we're all aware that many of the cold climate grapes are high in acid. Um, this table, excuse me, this figure is to show you acidity on the left axis and sugar on the right. And if we, we are trying to breed for this pink box in the middle. So enough sugar to produce a good wine, but acids in a reasonable amount so that the winemaker has less trouble and the wines can be targeted for um, a traditional wine drinker who prefers dry styled wines. 
I'd like to point out in this figure in particular, if you look up in the upper right-hand corner, that's Vitus riparia. That's way outside the box. And Frontenac is just one step from that, um, from being wild. And as we get further and further away from those genetics of riparia, we're moving closer and closer to the pink box. Marquette is close by, La Crescent as well. But you know, for many of our wine consumers and winemakers who are familiar with things like Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, those are ideal targets for us. So we get to start evaluating that this fall, we collect berries and we actually have been sampling about 150 individuals a year to get their juice chemistry from to see if we're on target and which of those um, aren't in this pink box. Unfortunately, as I'm tasting in the vineyard, your mouth, my mouth gets fatigued, tired. You taste one very high acid grape and you can't taste anything else the rest of the day. So using a titrator to measure acids and a high, um, a uh, refractometer to measure sugars is a better strategy than using a mouth. And of course, we have other cool stuff that's going on. As we move into fall, we'll start to see plants that have great fall color or maybe different leaf shapes like this uh, lacy leaf grape in the middle. And so as we get to see more and more variation and move through the season, we find other things that are exciting. So of course, these probably aren't ideal for winemaking, but just thinking about other applicability for plant materials that we have in the horticultural market. Of course, this is a giant team effort. Um, a large group of people photographed here over the years have been involved in different ways. This picture is when we were planting one of our nurseries, planting out about, I don't know, 6,000 vines, I think that day. Um, by hand, and of course, a uh, big crew in the vineyard and the rest of the team. So big thanks to them for all of their support for making this go. I will stop there. And of course, if there's questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. Thank you, Matt. And I don't see any questions right now, but um, we can go ahead and transition to uh, Leslie. Do you have slides? Okay, great. Um, and while we do that, Matt, uh, I know in, you get this question too, so maybe you can't answer it, but um, growers do ask me like how many more years until the next variety? Is there any, uh, any answer you'd like to give for that question? Sure, we are um, in the process of having a variety release in 2022. Um, we're working to release Minnesota 1220. There's still a lot of, uh, hurdles to get over, small ones, production hurdles and naming and patenting and all of those things. But that is something that's been on our radar since 1998, I think. Unfortunately, it's not cold hardy for most of zone four. It might take some trial and error, some growers who are interested in trying it out, but it has performed very well in um, the trials in Wisconsin, around Madison and Ames and other places. So that's one that we're, we are moving forward in the pipeline and just trying to figure out the best strategy to do that. So stay tuned for more. Exciting, thank you. Oh, everyone asked what kind of grape is it? It's a white wine grape. All right, cool. Well, any more questions you think of for Matt, you can type them in the chat at any point and then we'll get to those at the end. Um, so we're gonna transition to Leslie uh, to talk about cluster rot diseases and managing those. Awesome, thanks Annie. And thank you, Matt, for sharing it. I haven't heard much about the breeding program, so it was really nice to learn to see what you guys are working on. And even as a pathologist, I'm happy to see there's good work going against the diseases, even if that means I get to see a little bit less. So uh, speaking of that, this is our pre-harvest, uh, right before things get busy all over again uh, for most of you attending today. So I just wanted to kind of review some of the cluster rot diseases we might see at this time of the year and how we manage them. Um, this year has been quite odd uh, of, of the season. So I would anticipate a lot of folks aren't seeing as much uh, disease as they've seen in previous seasons, but I think it's still worthwhile to go over, especially as we're seeing variation hit at much earlier times than in previous years. So before I jump into specifics, I wanted to actually go over some really valuable data that was accumulated, or I should say collected, um, Several years ago, uh, Dave Jones is a grad student with my predecessor, Patty McManus, and he did some really excellent work looking at disease susceptibility uh, for several of the cold climate varieties. So first, looking at downy mildew specifically, and we're able to look at risk of foliar damage uh, against several cultivars. And so you can see here, I just want to highlight both the severe and um, 
uh, high categories. So we've got Valiant, La Crosse, and La Crescent uh, from that severe to high standpoint. And then on the lower end of things, we've got Frontenac, Frontenac III, and Marquette. And this has been pretty consistent with what we've been seeing as well uh, in the vineyards in the years since. Um, something for powdery mildew, which as I'll talk about a little bit later, this has actually been a very big year for powdery mildew um, due to that lack of rain and kind of more humid conditions um, in the vineyard. So uh, for severe uh, varieties, Brianna, uh, Frontenac, and Frontenac Gris tend to be really quite severe. Um, in fact, the Brianna at our research station right now is just completely covered in powdery mildew, both foliar and on the fruit. Um, Marquette is also quite susceptible. And I just want to note that the asterisks next to the different varieties uh, are letting you know about fruit and rachis susceptibility as well, uh, rating going from high to slightly to moderate for some cultivars such as Marquette and La Crosse. Um, and then for very low side of things, uh, we're seeing things for La Crescent, St. Croix, and Valiant again. But again, that we're also seeing infections not only on the leaves, but also on the fruits. And then finally for black rot, this is the other disease rated uh, during that time period. Uh, and we see Valiant Marquette, Frontenac, Frontenac Gris uh, for severe to high. And then on the lower end of things, Brianna, St. Croix, and La Crescent. And again, not only are we looking at foliar damage, we are looking at um, fruit damage as well. And I've put here in blue that the peat pearl is highly susceptible uh, to black rot as well. And this wasn't included in that initial data set, but this has been observed over several years. And in fact, this year, uh, we're seeing a fair amount of black rot on the petite pearl planting that we have in our West Madison vineyards. So jumping into the diseases, we'll first start with powdery mildew. And I'm gonna cover powdery mildew, downy, and black rot, even though these are typically early season diseases in terms of how we uh, manage them in terms of fungicides. If they're not well managed, they can continue into uh, fruit formation all the way through creation um, if not managed properly. So I'm gonna cover them here today. As we know, powdery mildew is favored by high humidity and those warmer temperatures. Uh, berries are either usually infected with those spores, um, those windborne spores from fungal colonies on the rachis or the pedicel of your plant. Uh, and then we're oftentimes seeing um, infections on leaves, then followed by infections on fruits sometime. Um, Pre-bloom infections of clusters or infection of berries uh, within a week of their formation actually can result in the most severe cases. And I think this is what we're seeing, especially with those kind of quicker times this year, uh, potentially missing some spray um, windows for control of powdery mildew. Uh, long term, uh, infected berries can desiccate in mummies. So this might be the time of year potentially seeing that on some varieties. Um, and this can increase susceptibility to infection to other fungi or bacteria um, later during the season. In terms of management, as I mentioned, this is one of those diseases that that critical period to control powdery mildew is actually going to be in early spring when those ovarine structures start to release spores. So for us, that's gonna be pre-bloom to two to four weeks after bloom. So I know we are way past this, uh, but just really wanna emphasize that even though you're still able to see visually now the results of infections that happened weeks, months ago. Uh, I've got some organic management's gonna be in blue in this presentation, just on um, future slides including this one. Uh, so we've got sulfur, which is great preventative and curative. Um, however, with issues like rain, you'd have to apply pretty frequently to make sure you're getting that constant contact with the fungus. Uh, Stylet oil, uh, potassium bicarbonate also provide good control and good post-infection activity. Now, because powdery mildew um, is highly prone to resistance, uh, it's really viable to try and take mix one of your curatives with your protectant products and continually rotate. It's not ideal to rely on your DMIs or your strobularins throughout the season. So again, really focusing on rotation, especially in a year like this when we're seeing um, and a bit more heavy on some varieties. There are also some powdery mildew specific fungicides, Vivondo, Clintech, and Torino, and those are very effective. Uh, just be mindful of the post-harvest interval on some of these um, fungicides. and know that they don't have efficacy against other fungal diseases. Again, I mentioned resistance, so just want to emphasize that with powdery mildew especially. And now thinking kind of post-harvest, even though this is a pre-harvest webinar, you're still going to want to maintain some protection against those foliar um, infections because this is going to help pre prevent defoliation so that going into winter, you're going to be a bit more hardy and not lose some of that hardiness if you let these infections get out of control. So downy mildew. Uh, this has not been a big year for downy mildew because the conditions haven't been incredibly conducive for us um, 
in Wisconsin. Uh, granted, we have seen a little bit of foliar downy mildew in parts of the canopy, but nothing quite too severe. Um, we, have, we haven't really had a lot of rainfall. Most of that secondary anaphylam is going to actually come from early season infections, but they do require that rain to move and infect new tissue. So without the rain, with enough time passing, without rain, that those spores will, will dry out. The good air circulation is really vital in terms of management and really conditions that allow for rapid drying within that canopy to reduce disease pressure. And as I mentioned, we haven't really observed too much uh, downy mildew at the station this year. In terms of management, there's numerous products. Um, Zampro, Rebus, Rubus Top, they provide excellent control. Um, all products for downy mildew, I should start by saying, uh, need to be used with care. Uh, again, this is another um, pathogen that uh, is very prone to resistance um, from all these different fungicides. Brandman as well is also good for control, but has a much larger uh, pre-harvest interval. And then phosphorotol, or I should say phosphorus acid products like phosphorotol, um, are great at preventative and post-infection activity. However, these should not be used on moderate to severe infections. Ritamil, as I think we all know, highly effective, highly expensive, um, and also highly prone to resistance development. So this should be used wisely, oftentimes early in the season, and you really don't want to be using many applications of Ritamil and it should not be applied to uh, very extreme or severe infections. We've got organic options. Copper provides good control, but of course there's a risk of phytotoxicity to those young tissues. And LifeGuard also provides fair protection. I emphasized resistance before, but I still have it noted here. Um, and again, thinking about protecting susceptible varieties from pre-bloom all the way to post-harvest. Again, that same idea in terms of those foliar infections, keeping that plant healthy, so as it moves into dor dormancy, it keeps and maintains that winter hardiness. Black rot, as I mentioned, several ports on Petite Pearl this year, specifically um, uh, for some growers, I've had several emails within the last month uh, where they've had some pretty severe infections. Um, we, like I said, this is a leaf from our research station and I haven't checked the berries this week, but I will be going out there later this week to check. Um, Black rot infections are favored by humidity. It seems to be a great year, especially on susceptible varieties for black rot. Uh, spores are typically depleted by the end of bloom. So this goes back to that idea of that critical spray period, right? So oftentimes these sprays are happening way early in the season. And if that critical window is missed, we are now actually getting to see those infections because there's a bit of a staggered or latent period before these infections are actually popping up. On um, berries, what you might see in your vineyard if you do have black rot is it almost starts out as like a cream or tan colored dot on your berry. It becomes surrounded by this necrotic tissue. That necrotic tissue can spread and then you might start seeing fruity bodies of the fungus if you have a hand lens with you. Uh, these lesions can also uh, form on petioles or shoots. So as you're going through uh, dormancy and doing any sanitation before bud break happens, this is a good time to keep an eye out for uh, old infections from the previous season and trying to get those out. Yep, sanitation, again, before bud breaks is really critical. This is gonna be one of the most crucial things you can do for black rot prevention. It's really getting that inoculum out of the trellis, out of your canopy. Uh, critical spray period, as I mentioned, is immediate pre-bloom to two to four weeks after bloom. So right, say most of us are out of that period, uh, but we might now be seeing infections that happen during that period if sprays were missed. Mangazed and Zyram provide excellent control, and copper uh, provides moderate control, but those short intervals are going to be required on varieties that are pretty susceptible and in very high disease situations. So I'll just bring this up before I cover a couple more diseases, and that is ontogenic or age-related resistance. And this comes up a lot. There's a lot of inconsistencies um, in terms of the periods. Uh, after bloom when a berry or fruit becomes resistant. Um, and so, and a lot of that information I should also note is um, based on Vitus vinifera. So I've listed here kind of what I've been able to find is somewhat of a consensus because it is a question sometimes that comes up. Um, but I also want to note that this varies among different Vitus species, as you can see here, varieties, and also climates as well, right? We've seen this past year with the weather, how quickly that phenology has changed. So just kind of keeping these different variations in mind when we think about what this age-related resistance means. So four to five weeks after bloom for downy mildew, again, measurements based on vinifera, six to seven weeks after bloom for black rot, then five weeks uh, specifically for concord. 
and then four to six weeks after blowing for powdery mildew, and this is for vinifera, and two to four weeks for concord. So again, kind of averages of what is, is, is available for these particular species. So moving to phomopsis, this is um, uh, most inoculum is dispersed between bud break and pre-bloom. And in fact, this is probably going to be one of the first sprays of the season that you're doing. So this could be your mangazeb, your captain, your diorama, or your copper. Um, this is one of the first sprays you're doing because most of the spores are actually going to be depleted earlier on in the season. So if you're missing your application now, you might actually see infections. Um, excuse me, if you're missing your applications early, you might be seeing those symptoms now. Uh, it's favored by cool and wet weather, and uh, latent infections are quite common with phomopsis. So the effects are varied during that uh, pre-bloom to bloom period. And then as the fruits start to ripen, you're actually starting to then potentially see symptoms of phomopsis on the fruits. Um, at this point in the season, Fungicides are not going to help because I said the spores are depleted, the infections already happened, and now with abrasion, you might actually see um, those symptoms start to show up. So unfortunately, fungicides aren't going to have any action at this point. Uh, so thinking forward, then to dormancy, what you can do if you have noticed high phomopsis pressure in your vineyard is sanitation. So removing um, those canes that have fruiting bodies on them, and also liquid lime sulfur applications have been shown to reduce some of that disease pressure as well. And dormancy before bud break. So we tried to sponge rot. Not sure how common that is here. I thought uh, Matt had some excellent pictures kind of showing the looser versus some of the, the tighter clusters. And that's going to be a massive influence for something like Botrytis but sponge rot. Uh, it likes humid, very stagnant still air. Uh, berry injury can actually increase susceptibility. So that's insects, probably bird feeding, rain, Powdery mildew scarring can all make fruits more susceptible to botrytis. Uh, ripening berries are a common target for botrytis, but again, this is kind of more of the time of the year that you would actually see that. Um, late infections are initiated at bloom and senescent flowers, and then they become active as the berries ripen. Uh, additionally, high nitrogen and tight clusters can influence this disease. Uh, Pre-verasion sprays that would be targeting latent infections of botrytis can be helpful for, again, these tighter clustered varieties. Uh, post verasion sprays, when the berries are most susceptible, um, are really going to be key and wet and humid seasons. Again, season has not been like that at all uh, for, for Wisconsin for most of the season. Uh, there's a numerous fungicides that are registered for botrytis bunch rot to control. Uh, most uh, higher performing fungicides tend to be in the FRAC7, or FRAC 11 groups. Again, highly prone to resistance, so it's important to rotate these chemistries if you're using them. Um, and I listed some at the bottom here. Like I said, there's quite an extensive list in the fruit pest management guide that I encourage you to consult. Um, but Elevate, Loon Experience, Pristine, and then our organic options typically provide moderate control. So Cyrox, another big one, has been emerging within the last several years. There's been a lot of really excellent research out of Cornell um, regarding saw rot. And then uh, more recently after that, uh, Megan Hall from Missouri uh, had did some additional research on saw rot. So it's kind of a, a recipe with four ingredients, if you will, uh, where you start with a wounded grape. And these yeasts that tend to be indigenous either on the surface or inside of the grape ferment the sugar of the grape, turn it into ethanol. And then the acetic acid bacteria make that ethanol into vinegar, and that brings on the fruit flies. So kind of a sequence of events here that really culminates into the unfortunate symptoms that you're seeing to the right of your screen here for sour rot. Uh, loose cluster varieties are going to be less susceptible, which makes sense. You're having less berries so tightly clustered together, creating this really ideal microclimate and uh, resulting in easier spread. Warm weather and oftentimes rain are really quite conducive to disease development. Currently, management uh, recommendations are the use of an insecticide, an oxidate, or some other antimicrobial on a weekly basis. And this is going to actually start happening once you start seeing those uh, fruit flies in the vineyard. Um, by the time you can actually start to smell sour rot, which I would imagine the grapes in the photo to our right, there was probably somewhat of an odor present, um, your chemical control will have some limitations, right? This is still treating preventatively is the way that we like to go about this. Um, but understanding that's not always an option. Things show up quickly. Um, so just understand that your control might have some limitations once you're actually able to smell because things are already underway 
uh, in terms of that sour rod process. And as I mentioned, there is ongoing work at Cornell to optimize spray timing with the insecticide and oxidate um, combination. So hopefully more from uh, them in the next couple of years on this in terms of management. So some other rods that I didn't focus on in too much detail simply because most of the fungicides uh, you would be using to manage black rot or Phromopsis early on in the growing season um, can have efficacy against some of these other rots that you might see. So ripe rot, for instance, I believe is called Totricum, that can oftentimes be well managed with some of your black rot fungicides. Uh, bitter rot, uh, important thing to note about bitter rot, I would say it can be confused with black rot uh, symptom-wise, uh, but bitter rot typically infects those berries that are post Eurasian, whereas your black rot pathogen is actually going to be infecting those green, um, not fully mature berries. And then finally, anthracnosis tends to more or less come along in wetter years, and I haven't seen much of that even full bear anthracnose at the research station this year. But again, a lot of those Phomopsis black rot um, fungicides that you're using early in the season can help um, reduce disease pressure of something like anthracnose. So I've listed here uh, spray guides, as I always try to, just to remind you of the resources. So they're photographed, but there's also some QR codes at the bottom. If anyone has uh, got their cell phone handy and the camera out, you can uh, scan over that QR code and open you straight to the website. And I also wanted to show the new 2021 organic production IPM guide for grapes out of Cornell. So this came out a little while ago. I think the most recent version before this was 2016. So if, um, folks interested, it is available now, the most current version. And additionally, before I close out here, I think this is our last um, formally scheduled webinar. As I mentioned, things are getting ultra busy now as harvest is probably coming a lot sooner than folks expected. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight from the previous webinars we've had this season, uh, they can be found at the Fruit News website on that first link here. I also wanted to encourage those, if you haven't already signed up, please sign up for our free news newsletter at our website as well. Uh, and also wanted to highlight the blog uh, that Annie works very hard on, uh, which I believe is fruit and vegetables. <laughs> uh, and that website is right here. So thank you all for your time. And I will check the chat for questions. Great summary, Leslie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing those guides at the end as well. And I'm going to open the chat up and um, I want to try to put those links in that you just listed. Uh, so there's there's one of them there. I didn't catch the first one. I know it was the Wisconsin Fruit YouTube channel link, but maybe you could post that in the chat. Um, and then the Fruit News one in the chat as well would be helpful. Um, yeah, so just a note about those guides. I, I don't have a feel for how many growers have actually downloaded or purchased those spray guides that you put at the end. Those are tremendously helpful. And I really do think that everybody should have them. Um, like when Leslie or I get questions from growers saying like, what's the pre-harvest interval for this product? Um, we, we open those guides and look them up because we don't have all those memorized. We, we need to save our brain space for other stuff. So we don't have them memorized either. So you, as growers, you can also just purchase those guides and look that information up yourselves. And it's very helpful to do that. Um, so what was I, what was I going to ask you, Leslie? I, oh yeah. Um, so if somebody is out in their vineyard and they see a rot on their clusters or they see uh, spots on leaves, but they're having trouble finding photos online that really match. Um, they're having trouble just diagnosing what it might be. Um, at what point should they try to diagnose that themselves versus um, email one of us versus send it to the disease clinic for diagnosis? That's a really good question, Annie. Uh, yeah, I say, especially at this time of the year when you've got all the green tissue out or, you know, maybe purple tissue at this point with Parisian, um, things can start to get really muddled and look quite similar. Uh, so I'd say the first line to do is, I know for our diagnostic lab in Wisconsin, we actually now do photo diagnostics is the newer thing I think brought on this year. But photos can be sent to our diagnostician, Brian Huddleston. Uh, photos could be sent to us as well. I think that's the first line of defense. If we're able to identify it from the photo, great. 
if it confuses everybody, then I think that's the next step where you'd want to send in a sample against those diagnostic labs for uh, diagnosis to just determine what pathogen you're dealing with. I, there are very minor um, differences in some of the diseases, but if you have multiple diseases going on or you've got the impacts of drought or a nutrient deficiency on top of that, things can get really confusing. So I think it's best to uh, start with pictures and then if we can't get it from that, we'll, we'll take a physical sample. Okay, thanks. A few questions came in over the chat. One is, how do you spray when you have netting over the grapes? That's a great question. We're actually going to put our netting on next week, I think. Uh, so I, I don't know, Annie, have you dealt with that? This is my first rodeo with the netting. Yeah, so um, what you're spraying does go through the net. Um, and I can say that with confidence because we have a lot, a lot of experience spraying through net. Um, also, because I'm on a project right now where we're using extremely fine mesh insect exclusion netting on apple trees and uh, that is on the trees the entire season and they're still spraying through it and they're still able to get good disease control with their fungicides through the netting. So um, those droplets are small and they can get through the net, especially with bird net where your holes are pretty big. So I, I really wouldn't be um, that concerned about that. Um, okay. Is the information on spraying contained in the Growing Grapes in Minnesota guide? And um, Leslie, I'll take a crack at that question first, since I am really familiar with that guide. Um, the Growing Grapes in Minnesota guide is an awesome resource. Um, however, it's not updated nearly as frequently as the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide, which is updated every two years. So if you want to make sure you're getting the most up-to-date information on product names, product efficacy, et cetera, I would do the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. And I would use the Growing Grapes in Minnesota Guide for things like if you just need to find a quick um, efficacy table um, and get general information on products. But the product names are more general in that guide um, versus you know new products come out every once in a while. And the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide is going to have all of that very, very updated. And that's why like, I, Leslie, I don't know how you guys do this in your fruit news, but whenever we put out articles um, about, let's say, diseases or insects, we usually don't list a lot of names of products. And that's because our articles live online forever. And we want people to go to those guides because the guides are going to have the updated info. That's why we do that. Yep, totally agree. We try and do the same thing. And that's why I've been trying to show it at the end of the presentations to remind folks that it's there. Um, if you prefer a digital copy, that's the great thing is you're able to click right into it with the link. Um, if you want to scan it, I actually like that way because I can control F or command F depending upon your computer and get right to your crop, get right to your disease, get right to your fungicide. So it's nice having that, that ease of access. And both Annie and I are contributors to the, the guide. So we're we're getting that inside look and trying to make updates as they come every couple of years. Um, I will say something that I think is slowly changing with these guys, which is really excellent, is that I think because a lot of the research we have is very based on vitis vinifera, we're starting to see more research and information accumulated for the cold climate varieties uh, when it comes to disease, when it comes to insects, obviously with a lot of the work that, uh, that Matt's been doing as well. So that's starting to, I feel like, filter its way more into the guide. And I hope that provides more um, guidance to growers specifically within our areas that are growing those cold climate grapes. Um, someone has a question about weed control. He says, how important is weed control right now? Um, I mean, just in general, I, I can take a crack at it generally. So we, the, one of the biggest things you wanna do with weed control is not let weeds go to seed. Because if you've got weeds in your vineyard that are actually producing flowers and producing seeds, then those seeds are falling. They're producing new weeds next year, obviously. And not just next year, but future years as well. So a couple of uh, little examples. Um, a lamb's quarter plant can produce up to 100,000 seeds per plant. And those seeds can survive in the soil for like, I don't remember how many years exactly, but it's many years. <laughs> Um, they don't just fall and then germinate the next year. They'll, they'll be there for a really long time if they don't germinate right away. <laughs> so it's really important not to, not to leave weeds out in the field if you can help it, even if that means going out and mowing down large weeds before they go to seed. Um, 
because with herbicide control, herbicides are most effective on weeds that are under six inches tall, unless you're using a rate of an herbicide that's above the label or you're dousing it. So it's really best to control weeds with herbicides earlier. And if they're getting really tall, like a foot, two feet tall, mowing is gonna be more effective for you generally. So um, that's why you want to still focus on weed management late in the season. Um, any more questions? Andy, there was one at the beginning that I'm primed to answer. It was about why are we growing grapes from seed instead of from cuttings? And that's a great question. So for a plant breeding program, like what we're trying to do here, we actually want new genetic material. And so by growing seedlings, we're assuring the fact that we're getting um, combinations from two parents and we're controlling that. So we're choosing the female to be one donor and selecting the pollen exclusively. So in the seedlings that we produce, we know they're, they're going to be unique and grapes are cool. They're like humans and that every seedling, even though they have the same two parents, the, the siblings, like maybe you and your siblings are different. The grapes are like that and we can have an infinite number of unique individuals. And that allows us to create something new. Um, and then when we move to our second test, that's when we start cloning those plants through cuttings or tissue culture, um, or in some cases, grafting, if we're really feeling um, ambitious. But uh, yeah, cuttings work really well. And that's how you can keep a, get a, um, a whole vineyard of the same variety is by cloning. I think a couple of questions came in. I'm just trying to scroll up so I can see them. Oh, uh, someone asked, we have a lot of varieties and are always looking for a comprehensive bricks guide for all of the cold hardy grapes. So where can she go to find out what bricks target to aim for during harvest? Yeah, I think Carrie's got like, I don't know, 20 different varieties of grapes and they're not all the U of M varieties either. Good question. I just got that last week. I don't have an answer, but I think it's a target that this group should be working on. Annie and I are specifically putting together some fact sheets on the U of M varieties about sort of what to expect, but a, a nice table to add into the Grand Grapes of Minnesota book or another resource would be useful. Um, sugar is one thing to monitor, flavor development, color, acidity. Um, Drew Horton, the enologist on my project, um, he swears by pH over almost anything else. And so it sort of depends on your experience and what equipment you have. Um, and, so and that's hard. It's hard to put into a table. Yeah. If somebody's growing a lot of table grapes for fresh eating, then um, do you know what general pH they might be going for? I mean, you wouldn't want to harvest them too acidic or it's going to be hard to eat. Right, so in that case, maybe more towards sugars and table grapes, like the global varieties, they're harvested typically under 18 degree bricks. And that's a little underripe because many of them are getting shipped around the globe. And like, it's hard to say for our varieties, you know, Brianna, we know is better if you pick it below a pH of about 3.2 and below a, um, a soluble sugar bricks rating of 18. Otherwise it gets to be a little foxy and overripe. So uh, I wish we had a better uh, Rosetta Stone or something that shows all the varieties and it's something that we can certainly work on. Yeah. And a lot of those, um, you know, the, the old table grape varieties, those were Swenson varieties. And I'm not sure whether Elmer Swenson ever um, developed like a table with bricks targets for his varieties. I mean, those are, <laughs> Matt's like, I'm <laughs> uh, just saying, John Taylor, of course, what does your winemaker want and what parameters are there? You know, if you're just a grower and contracting or working with um, a winemaker, it's great for the winemaker to get in the field and know what you have, taste some things and, and target their uh, parameters that they're going for. And in fact, some will pay a premium for meeting some of those benchmarks. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, more questions uh, kind of trickle in. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk on today was insects. Um, and so I'll just say for Japanese beetles, um, there's a lot we could say about Japanese beetles right now, um, but Christelle talked a lot about Japanese beetles earlier in the season. Um, the recommendations are the same as what she was recommending at that, that webinar that we did in, I believe, June. 
Um, so if you go to the link that Leslie provided that has all the recorded webinars, you can get all the information you need to know about Japanese beetles on there. Um, one point that Christelle kind of drove home um, in that webinar is a little bit of Japanese beetle feeding is not going to make or break your vines. And uh, it, it, there can be some tolerance for Japanese beetle feeding because the vines, especially if they're very vigorous vines, not newly planted vines, but mature ones, um, they can handle some of that defoliation without really being affected. Um, so for example, there was one grower who's, uh, his wife was gonna give birth in the next week and he was like, do I need to go out and spray Japanese beetles? And I was like, no, you know, <laughs> it's not gonna be worth it if, if uh, you don't know when you're going to the hospital and your life is kind of crazy right now, you can just wait a little bit and, and not worry too much about it. It's not, it's not you know, that, that kind of critical, uh, yeah, it's, what am I trying to say? It's, it's, it's not the most critical thing happening in spring for Japanese beetles. And I know people can get anxious about it because the, um, the cosmetic damage that they're doing looks very severe. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is uh, spotted wing Drosophila. So spotted wing Drosophila, we, we know through research both at U of M and at uh, University of Wisconsin, because I think uh, Christelle mentioned this as well, that they really go for ripe fruits. Um, they do not uh, pierce unripe green fruit. And so um, this is something that we, what we talk about in July a lot is if you have a vineyard, you don't need to be spraying for SWD before verasion. Um, and even in ripe grapes, we know that SWD has a really hard time penetrating and laying eggs in the skin of our cold climate hybrid grapes. Um, they have trapped SWD flies in vials with ripe grapes of the different varieties and found that SWD really isn't laying eggs in them. What they might try to do though, is they might try to penetrate it and they could create a little scratch on the surface of the grape. And so theoretically, that could introduce um, sour rot, even if they're not truly penetrating the skin. Um, but I really wouldn't uh, try to spray for SWD unless your fruit is ripe and you are using traps on your vineyard and know that you have a heavy SWD population out there. I would, I would not um, spray preventatively for that. I would spray if, if you really know you need to, um, because the sprays that we apply for SWD uh, they're often restricted use pesticides, and often there's a, a maximum number of applications you could or should do um, in a season. So we want to use those, uh, those chemistries sparingly. And if you have questions on that, I'm pretty sure that Christelle has also talked about those in the previous webinars as well. Yep, and Annie, I was also going to, well, two things. One, I'm going to post in the chat uh, an article or just quick scouting report she uh, just wrote, I think, earlier this week, in fact, about wasps picking up and some of the vineyards that she is researching. So I'm going to put that in the chat. And then also I was going to mention our questions before we hit two. Awesome. Um, the poll questions, yes. I put in a plug. Next week, the um, Eastern Viticulture and Enology. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to get the name right. Um, Sorry, I was not prepared. The uh, uh, town hall meetings like Joe Fiola, Joe Fiola and Tim Martinson and others are hosting. Uh, that information I just pushed out to the Minnesota Grape Growers Google group and earlier today. So that has been a really great set of, uh, not really workshops, but a place to come and ask some really good questions. And they have some um, timely topics as well to hear from some excellent experts from Eastern half of the United States who are growing grapes. And unfortunately, I don't think I have a link, but if I can find one quick, I'll put it in the chat box. Yeah, it's tough because they advertise it using a flyer and I, yeah, if you can find a link, that'd be great. I'm actually uh, assigned to be one of the speakers of that webinar to give an update about what's going on in our region. Yeah, I'm looking for the link as well. I just registered myself, so. Nice. All right, I got there. Here's a registration link for folks to use. So sorry, there's not as much information there, but. Awesome. Yeah, but I think a couple of growers from Wisconsin I've seen in, in the meeting um, last year they've had, it's been really excellent to attend if you hadn't have, haven't had the opportunity yet. So they typically, I think, divide you into viticulture or an analogy room and whatever your preference at that time of the year, you can learn a lot. Yeah, so I imagine at that one next week, they'll probably be doing a pretty in-depth discussion of, um, you know, harvest metrics and 
and measurements of fruit, yeah. All right, well, um, I'll end the polling here. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining this week's webinar. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Matt, for sharing your expertise. And as always, if you have uh, questions for us, just go ahead and shoot us an email. All right, have a great rest of your week. Bye.